was happy and brainwashed <laughs> during that time. I came back to college. Um, I went from the, the Triangle Church back then was, was it almost 2,000 people? I don't know. It was definitely over 1,000. But I went to, came back to a congregation of 100 in Dayton, Ohio. And there weren't very many campus students. Um, in fact, I was, me and another guy were the only two college students there. I was the only one who lived on campus. So we went out and we did our thing and tried to recruit. And of course, we didn't have all the resources, some of the other bigger churches. So we were kind of looked down on to some degree. I didn't mind too much because, you know, it's a Catholic school. It's going to be a hard nut to break. And we would go over to other places. We'd go over to Wright State, Sinclair Community College, other college campuses up there. Um, and we had a little bit of success relatively. There's some other people we drew in. Um, but yeah, one of the things looking back on it, I was spared from some of the abuses during that time because we did, actually the church in Dayton was not a separate congregation. It was part of the overall Cincinnati, Cincinnati church. And, um, Cincinnati was huge. There were about 750 at its peak, and they had a campus ministry of pushing 100 people or so. And the campus ministry here in Cincinnati, especially at UC, is uh, notorious. And they seem to go away, but they seem to kind of change their tactics as time goes on and kind of work under the radar. And uh, they've grown and they've shrunk over the years, maybe about 50 to 100 people. Um, several of that, and kind of the, one of the interesting things about that is some of that, maybe a significant percentage of the people who are members now are children of first generation members. Because, you know, if your parents get converted in the 80s or 90s, then you're old enough to go to college, then okay, yeah, then you can be a second generation member. So they don't know any better. Um, and then places like Cincinnati, they have, um, they're well established enough that people from leaders from other churches send their kids there because it's a stable, it's a stable group. Um, so that went well and that relatively. And then in 2001, I graduated. I got a job in Cincinnati, moved down here to Cincinnati. And that's took about two years, a year and a half of it, it, well, it was a lot of work. They put me in the teen ministry. They had me literally driving all over town to get these teens, and I was discipling these teens. I barely knew what I was doing, um, and they were basically barely members. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they did that to keep us busy and keep the numbers up, and I was studying the Bible with one of the teens that was assigned to me, and then it was taken away by another leader. It's like, okay, how am I supposed to do this if they give me somebody else? Um, but there was the amount of pressure definitely ramped up to share my faith, to bring people to church. Um, again, it was pretty rough for that year and a half. Now, after the year and a half in 2003, when the Henry Creek letter came out, that's when everything fell apart. Um, basically, the pressure was off. And we were just kind of floating out there trying to figure out what we were supposed to be doing. We didn't have discipleship partners. We didn't have any, you know, we were looking for leadership of some time, but we didn't really trust anyone. Um, and basically, at least in Cincinnati and in other places, there, um, there was a group of people who said, okay, we don't have any elders here. So what we're going to do is, which is kind of weird for a church that's been around for over 20 years, not to have any elders, but I'm, Elders in the ICSC paradigm are basically yes men. Mm. They, the evangelist runs the entire show. The elders are just basically yes men trying to get people on board. That's their role. It's the only thing they do. So, um, yeah, so it's pretty interesting because they have like the lead evangelist and then a group of 11 other guys. And then as time went on the last couple of months, the committee went down from 12 members to 10 to 8 to it eventually got back down to one person, the lead evangelist. Oh, that's surprising. Um, basically, they said and promised, hey, things are going to change. Things are going to be different. And uh, we're going to repent and we're going to put this all behind us. Blah, blah, blah. Get rid of the abuses. Kit McKee's not leading us anymore. We've got this. 